Thank you, thank you, Artemy, and I would like to thank you for the invitation and also uh, the European University. It's a great, great pleasure to be here in St. Petersburg. Uh, I wanted to make some preliminary remarks about the paper uh, which I'm going to present today, tonight, which is pretty much of a work in progress. I've been working uh, on, on Lysenko and Soviet genetics, uh, and more will come out in discussion, I'm sure, from a certain perspective. The perspective is uh, my interest in the connection between Lacanian psychoanalysis and contemporary uh, evolutionary uh, biology from a materialist perspective. So it's a quite original uh, take on this whole debate. Uh, I also wanted to uh, specify two other things. First of all, this is a work in progress. I've been working on this for the last, say, eight months to one year. And it's also like a joint project which has started with uh, a friend from Moscow, Oksana Timofeva. So this is actually um, the second version of a paper we originally presented at the Historical Materialism Conference in London uh, last November, where I had the pleasure to meet uh, Artemy. And although, of course, as, as it always happens when you co-write something, although I mostly focused on the Lysenko part and Oksana focused more on the early Soviet culture and then the post-Soviet perestroika, uh, responses to that early Soviet culture. What I'm going to do today, to give you a, a right context for, for the discussion then, is to uh, go through also the part which is more on early Soviet culture and then move on to Lysenko and then make some uh, final remarks on uh, what I think is the generally, uh, to put it in these terms, reaction responses to uh, very generally speaking, speculations about animals and plants from uh, the early 20th century through the Stalin years and then, of course, uh, the post-Soviet uh, uh, period. Now, uh, I want to start with two, again, I think provocative is again the right adjective, two pro provocative quotations, and they come from two very different authors, but I think they well capture um, the critical, of course, the critical tone of uh, the presentation and also my use of Lysenko. Of course, I'm not trying to, to be uh, a, a, a blunt, straightforward supporter of Lysenko. I'm using Lysenko critically to return to some quite well-known debates um, about evolutionary uh, biology and the critique of genetics, of um, the genetics that came out of the so-called uh, great synthesis of the 1930s in Western Europe, a debate which has been started, I would say, as early as the 50s and 60s with big names like, for instance, Stephen Jay Gould. Okay? Um, the two quotations come, the first comes from Wilhelm Reich, uh, the psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich, we could say uh, the early Wilhelm Reich, that is to say before he moved to the United States and according to some became a psychotic. Uh, the second comes from a quite well-known, uh, well, well-known full-stop evolutionary biologist, that is to say Richard uh, Levantin, who collaborated uh, with uh, Stephen Jay Gould in, his, in the 70s on a number of technical biological papers and then became a very open critic of what he calls uh, the ideology of DNA and the ideology of uh, genetics. So, first quote from Wilhelm Reich from Dialectical Materialism and Psychoanalysis, a text of the late 20s. Reich writes, future dialectical materialist theories of science will probably not retain much of current theories of heredity, 1928, which constitute a unique source of strength for the whole of the bourgeois conception of civilization. They are mostly founded, these theories of heredity, on moral value judgments and contain few scientific elements." End of quote. The second epigraph, the second quote, comes again, as I said, from Richard Levantin, quite blunt, he writes, genes can make nothing. Now, the paper, as I said before, is the starting point, to give you a more general background, of a collaborative research project 
that aims to develop, I would say, a new dialectical materialist philosophical approach to subjectivity and human nature in their relation to science, psychoanalysis and politics. My background is in philosophy, even though I've been working mostly in the last 10 years on psychoanalytical theory and the connections with science. In this paper, I will briefly outline two opposites, uh, two opposite, uh, as, as it were, politics of nature and the way in which they inform the process of the production of subjectivity in early Soviet and early post-Soviet ideological narratives. I will analyze fictional representations of human, animal, and vegetative life as epitomized by the contrasting stances of Andrei Platonov's revolutionary writings and the perestroika culture's re reactionary responses to them, as well as scientific attitudes towards nature, namely the debates surrounding Lysenkoism and Soviet biology. And as I said, the Platonov and uh, early revolutionary culture uh, part of the paper and the project is mostly uh, Oksana's work, whereas I mostly focused on uh, the debates surrounding Lysenkoism in the 30s but also then um, in the last 20 years. There are people being published by MIT Press in biological theory uh, who do write about Lysenko. I mean, this is just uh, to, 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 uh, to, to say I'm not the only one um, uh, trying to um, return to these debates. And actually, um, maybe my exceptional position is that I'm not a scientist, whereas a, lo a number of um, well, uh, considered scientists are returning to these debates. After the October Revolution of 1917, the standards of a revolution in nature and even a struggle against nature were raised in all spheres of the nascent Soviet society. In the spirit, in the spirit of a revolutionary utopia, nature was supposed to be changed, both liberated from its reliance on necessity and preserved from the pre precariousness of its contingency. So you also had a debate, very open debate, as you may know, on the relativity of any clear-cut divide between notions of necessity in nature and notions of contingency. And this is, again, a very topical uh, issue in contemporary um, European philosophy. Think of uh, Kenton Meyasu best-selling book after finitude, which is actually a um, problematization of notions of necessity and contingency from, I would say, a post, post-structuralist, uh, uh, but you influence perspective. A diffuse avant-garde attitude unconditionally sustained the idea of a point of no return, a giving up the ship, as it were, a total transformation of the social and natural order towards emancipation and equality. Nature was also considered as a battlefield for class struggle. The active transformation of one species into another, e.g. of animals into humans, but also vice versa, accompanied by the acquisition of higher levels of consciousness and freedom, are themes that run through the Soviet literature, fictional literature, to begin with, and poetry of the period. As, as the futurist writer Velimir Kle, uh, Klebnikov puts it, yeah, you should correct me. I quote, I see freedom for horses and equal rights for cows. In his poem, The Triumph of Agriculture, Nikolai Zabolotsky, one of the founders of the Russian avant-garde absurdist group Oberyu, describes nature as suffering under the old bourgeois regime, compar compares explicitly animals with proletarians, and creates a utopia of their progressive liberation facilitated by technology. And I quote the poem in English, I'm sorry, maybe you should have uh, <laughs> provided any um, translation, but this is a quite good translation. It's been translated quite well. I saw a red glow in the window belonging to a irrational ox. The parliament of ponderous cows sat there engaged in problem solving. 
down below the temple of machinery manufacture oxygen pancakes. Their horses, friends of chemistry, had polymeric soup. Some others sailed midair, expecting visitors from the sky. A cow in formulas and ribbons baked pie out of elements, and large chemical oats grew in protective coats. So they almost pre preserved the, the rhymes in English. Now, naturally, Andrei uh, Platonov deserves special attention in this respect. Animality occupies a central place in Platonov's prose. He's able to read on animal faces the suffering and the hopes of a secret, sad, and unknown human being. And here, I think, as, as, as always, when you collaborate with somebody, um, I have some doubts about Platonov because I'm not completely sure that um, he is description of this uh, emancipatory animal, um, almost a, a proletarian human being hidden uh, beneath the skin of the animal, is not a certain form of humanism, of quite naive humanism. So I'm also sharing with you the tensions we have in this project. According to Oksana, no, it is anthropomorphism, but also in a sense a certain humanism, that is to say like a non-mediated um, um, an anthropomorphism, but also anthropocentrism. Mm? So it goes back to the debates concerning the early Marx. Uh, is it in a naive anthropocentrism? Is it not? Etc. Etc. Platonov's animal is a man in disguise, tortured by his unrecognized intellect, imprisoned in his natural body. While in his letter on humanism, famously Heidegger writes about the unsurpassable abyss, gap, separating animals from humans, the protagonist of Platonov's The Sea of Youth thinks that the gap between, between humans and other beings has to be overcome by means of communist revolution. And communist revolution has to continue, if not accelerate, Darwinian evolution, and thus ultimately liberate animals from their very animality. In Platonov, not only humans, but all living creatures, including plants, are overwhelmed by the desire for equality, a desire which, as Frederick Jameson, writing about Platonov, put, pointed out, has not yet found its Freud or Lacan. A passage from uh, uh, Chevingur. Chevingur, right? Chevingur. Chevingur is emblematic in, in this regard, and I quote Platonov, Chapurni touched a bardock. The bardock too wanted communism. The entire weed patch was a friendship of living plants. Just like the proletariat, this grass, the weed, endures the life of heat and the death of deep snow." End of quote. The desire for communism and equality originates from a profound boredom, the Russian Tosca, that is, from the unbearableness of the existing, fixed, unchangeable order of things. We should change the word as soon as possible, Platonov's Bolshevik says, otherwise even animals will eventually get mad. But again, this transformation follows the way of a struggle against nature, if not a struggle against the dialectic of nature, which is to be implemented by means of technology. As Platonov writes in his short essay on socialist tragedy, and I quote, it's a quite long quote, but interesting, the situation between technology and nature is tragic, Platonov says. The aim of technology, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. But the construction of nature is such that it does not like to be beaten. Nature keeps itself to itself. It can only function by exchanging like for like, or even with something added in its favor. But technology strains to have it the other way around. I'm still quoting. The external word is protected from us by a dialectic. Therefore, though it seems like a paradox, the dialectic of nature, I think this is the crucial point in the, in the quote, the dialectic of nature is the greatest resistance to technology and the enemy of humankind, Platonov writes. Technology is intended for and works towards 
the overturning or softening of the dialectic. So far, it has only modestly succeeded, and so the word still cannot be kind to us. I conclude with the quotation, Platon of Rights, important passage. At the same time, the dialectic alone is our sole instructor. So dialectic, in the end, is recuperated, not only opposed to technology. The dialectic alone is our sole instructor and resource against an early, senseless demise in childish enjoyment, just as it was the force that created all technology. So to sum up the quote, not only what seems to be at first sight an opposition between nature and the dialectic of nature uh, and technology is described by Platonov, but also this opposition between nature and the dialectic of nature and technology is itself dialectical. I think this is the point. The image of a new dynamic science that would contrast the status quo of old bourgeois science and the great expectations early Soviet culture had from the achievements of revolutionary technology were certainly not confined to the fields of literature and poetry about which I spoke so far. In 1931, uh, Yakovlev, the then commissar of agriculture, could claim that imminent discoveries will, quote, revolutionize the life of animals and plants. So this narrative which you find in early Soviet um, culture, especially literature and avant-garde poetry, is also present in the um, explicit and official statements of the um, Soviet regime. I have another quote uh, from, um, from, from, the, from uh, the commissar, with, from Yakovlev. This is more specifically targeted at the Lysenko debate about which I will start to talk in a bit. Um, Yakovlev says, this is from 1933, uh, we are, quote, in fact, approaching the art of transforming the plant according to our will, end of quote. Such statements were meant to overcome skepticism and include uh, elements of what up to that point had appeared to be fiction into science. So my general point here is that actually a certain discourse is well beyond what seems to us to be an unsurmountable divide between fiction, if not poetry, science, and at the same time uh, official politics. Mm? Class struggle is also a struggle in and against nature. Scientists themselves believed that socialism would have constructed a new relation between science and life. Of course, this is actually also, uh, it could, this whole debate, I think, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be related to uh, the genetic debates of the 30s, ag agrobiology and genetic de uh, debates of the 30s in the Soviet Union. But of course, it, it's also a debate that was originated uh, earlier on uh, from, from Stalin's uh, dazzled uh, with success. I mean, the more sort of like utopian and uh, optimistic uh, cultural, um, cultural propaganda of Stalin in those years. And dazzled with success, how do you translate that? that, that dazzled, dazzled with success. Uh, that, that Same as be successful, right? Yeah, Nevertheless. yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, caught by success, like excited by yeah. su success. Mm. I move on to uh, Lysenko. Richard Levins and Richard Levantin opened their 1985, we are in the Reagan years in the United States, opened their 1985 seminal volume, The Dialectical Biologist, printed by Princeton University Press, with the following daring epigraph, quote, to Frederick Engels, they write, who got it wrong a lot of the time, but who got it right where it counted, end of quote. The central thesis the two renowned scientists, then respectively professors of population sciences and of zoology at Harvard University, they are quite well known guys, the central thesis they put forward in their book is that a dialectical analysis is needed, quote, as a critique of the current state of biological theory, end of quote. A Marxist dialectic, they say, 
which unveils the fact that scientific and political questions are inextricably interconnected, dialectically related. This comes from 1983-84 uh, American scientists, well-known scientists. Actually, if you take it out of context, it could come from um, the late 20s or early 30s uh, Soviet uh, literature I was, I was referring uh, to before. I think the, when, when I came across this book, and it's a well-known book, it generated a lot of debates in the 80s and 90s, and then it was a bit forgotten. But I know of at least three or four people who, from different perspectives now, are working on this volume, The Dialectical Biologist. Um, outside of science, I'm talking about social sciences and, um, and psychoanalysis and, and, um, and politics. Moving from these pre premises, one of the most interesting chapters of the book of the Dialectical Biologist by Levins and Levantin is dedicated precisely to a reassessment, they call it an objective reassessment of the Lysenko case, of Lysenkoism more in general. Rather than focusing on the personal vicissitudes of the notorious agronomist who, thanks to Stalin's personal support, managed to make Soviet biology officially reject genetics, as you know, in 1948, the book, The Dialectical Biologist, tackles Lysenkoism as a widespread, they call it, Soviet mass m movement of the 1930s. To emphasize their shift of perspective, aimed at avoiding the simplistic totalitarian interpretation which tends to obscure the scientific and rational aspects of the Lysenko episode, Levins and Levantin propose a, what I find convincing, comparison with Stakhanovism. So let's not focus on Lysenko as the barefoot professor and his personal, of course, by now we know, uh, very close connection with Stalin. Let's uh, focus on what was going on within and outside the university discourse in those years and why, what are the reasons, the sociological, intellectual, but also scientific reason why, in a sense, Lysenkoism triumphed. So you get the point. I mean, a number of books were written about Lysenkoism, both in Western Europe and even in Soviet Russia after 1962. There's the famous volume by Medvedev, a scientist himself. They all tend to actually focus on kind of sociological analysis of the so-called personality cult. That is to say, look, when you are actually living in a completely totalitarian regime, this is what happens to uh, science. That is to say, science is completely subjected to politics. So in a sense, they take Lysenko to relate to Stalin in the same way as Rosenberg related to Hitler, for instance. I think what uh, Levins and Levantin do, and they were the first but not the only ones, now there are historians of science working a lot on this issue, they're trying to say, of course there was a personality cult. Of course there were the purges and people like Vavilov were sent to the Gulag. But this is not the all issue. How do we deal with the fact that what will be in a few decades, the second technological power of the world, uh, able to send, well, we are here in Gagarinskaya, able to send somebody uh, in That's space. A, it's a count, count Gagarin. Oh, really? Uh, so that was a mistake, yeah. They're not related. They're not, not related. Uh, that, I, that, was my, that was my projection then. It was a quite a good projection. So the, the point of view is like, yes, of course, there was such thing as the personality cult and that influenced in the Stalin years and even in the Khrushchev year because in a sense Lysenko had more power during the Khrushchev year. I think in terms of historical research, this is quite proved after 48, um, after the genetic congress of 48, the anti-genetic conf uh, conference of 48. This is a matter of fact. Of course, the personality cult influenced the relation and the liberty uh, of scientists and their relation with politics, but this is not the whole story. How can we account for the fact that a freak, as somebody uh, called him, uh, was able to actually create a, 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 a biology or a biological theory which, in spite of all its weaknesses, uh, try to completely detach itself from Western biology. How was that able to happen? How was it able to make that happen? And the movement itself was, and the regime was able to make that happen at the same time when, uh, of course, uh, the Soviet Union was able to, after a couple of decades, but if we are talking about the 
um, main years of Lysenkoism in the 50s, when that was the real establishment. Um, how do the two things can happen together? Okay, and I think this is a much more interesting question in terms of the history of science, to, to say the least. So Richard Levin, uh, Levins and Richard Levantin, um, in terms of history of science, propose a convincing comparison with uh, history of science and history of sociology, we can say, with Stakhanovism. Like Stakhanovism, Lysenkoism, at least in the 30s, before they, it became um, completely um, establishment-based, Lysenkoism was, was, according to them, in its early stages, characterized by a strong anti-elitist and populist element. Not only was the Lysenko movement an, attempted, an attempt at a scientific revolution, but, and I quote, they say, an incipient cultural revolution. They don't develop that, but they make a quite clear connection as scientists to certain debates that were circulating in Maoist China during the Cultural Revolution. It was an attempted and failed incipient cultural revolution that completely failed, a fiasco, and they recognized that. In other words, according to Levinson and Levantin, the Lysenkoist attack on crucial aspects of Western bourgeois science, such as the metaphysical assumption of heredity theory, the standardization of statistical methodology in biology and the uh, social sciences, and the dissociation of the life sciences from philosophy, all things we live with right now, uh, the, the attack of um, Lysenkoism on these aspects of Western bourgeois science is for them inextricable from a class conflict, a very clear class conflict between self-taught, barely literate plant breeders from peasant origins, such as Lysenko himself, and pure geneticists, who had not, most of them, endorsed the Bolshevik Revolution, but nonetheless still retained considerable power in Soviet academia. So, if I may contextualize this uh, point uh, Levin Levantin do from uh, a more psychoanalytical Lacanian perspective, I think their point is that, in a sense, the Lysenkoist movement in the 30s, when the battles, the uh, theoretical battles, were being um, fought in the Soviet Union about the genetics, should be taken as an attempted uh, revolution, an attempted cultural attack against the university discourse. Mm? An attack on the university establishment as such. And the fact that, in a sense, the positions of power still in Stalinist the Soviet Union of the 30s in the life sciences were actually um, taken, were still occupied by people who had either not endorsed at all the Bolshevik Revolution or endorsed the revolution at a late date. Mm? Of course, the other point here is that if Lysenkoism was in the end a fiasco, and it clearly was, it's because it's very difficult, and I think also not that useful, to distinguish between its early stages where it launched an attack against the university discourse and the moment at which, and we could say, uh, after 1948, when genetics was more or less formally forbidden, the moment at which Lysenkoism became the epitome of the university discourse. Okay? So in a sense, like, it's an attack on, on the university discourse, which led to an even more, uh, how should I put it, uh, solid, rigid, and uh, non-transparent um, establishment of a certain university discourse, which is one with uh, which becomes one with uh, political power. Now, what I've said so far is about two scientists, Levins and Levantin, very famous, and my way of reading them. Um, the other reference about which I will talk uh, for the next five to ten minutes is quite different. It comes from uh, a pamphlet written by, in 1977, a pamphlet written by, uh, it's unsigned, but we know who wrote it, by the uh, Union Communiste de France Marxiste-Leninist, which maybe doesn't tell you much, but it was, in those years, Alain Badiou's uh, political Maoist movement in France. It's a pamphlet entitled uh, Contre les cours et Althusser. Uh, les cours 
historian of science, Marxist, very close to the French Communist Party, wrote what is arguably, to date, the most uh, convincing, for some, attack on Lysenkoism. Okay? So this is a pamphlet against Le Cour, uh, whom uh, Badiou associates with Althusser and the PCF, the French Communist Party. So it's, a, in a sense, very similar for me, the points, as you will see, they make from this more openly political perspective, Maoist perspective, and as philosophers, the point they make is strangely, oddly enough, quite close in 1977 to the point the American scientists make from a scientific perspective eight years later. Okay. And remember, the Lysenko case in France um, was, had huge repercussions on intellectual life uh, in the early 1950s. Okay. We know that, especially, for instance, from uh, writings of uh, Jacques Monod, um, prize, a Nobel Prize winner for medicine, uh, geneticist uh, in the early 60s. Jacques Monod, himself a, a, a Communist Party member, left the party uh, in the early 50s because the party actually tried to impose Lysenkoism uh, in France to uh, basically its, its scientific members. Okay? There's a very nice exchange of letters between Aragon, so completely different context, of course, uh, uh, surrealism, post-surrealism, and Jacques Monod himself, and Aragon trying to convince uh, Monod that he should stay in the party and endorse uh, Lysenkoism, which he didn't do, of course. And, and Monod uh, became one of the most outspoken in the 50s, even before gaining international uh, uh, notoriety with his research in, he's the father of, um, we could say, cellular, um, microcellular and cellular biology, okay? So it's the beginning of cutting edge research that still goes on on enzymes, et cetera, et cetera, today. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe you know uh, Monod fr from his 1968 more philosophical book, uh, Lazare de la Nécessité, chance and necessity. So it's a whole scientific uh, discussion of the notions of contingency and necessity in science, which was very, very famous in the early 70s in Western Europe. Now, as I said, a very similar point to the one made by the two American scientists about the class struggle component of Lysenkoism and its attempt at promoting a cultural revolution in science is made from a more openly political perspective in a 1977 pamphlet of the Union Communiste de France Marxiste Leniniste, the militant group led in those years by Alain Badiou, entitled Contre les Cours et Althusser. So against Les Cours and Althusser's, according to them, revisionist identification of Lysenko with a charlatan pseudoscientist, a delirious puppet of Stalin, the text strongly claims that the vehement debates on agrobiology and genetics in the USSR of the 30s and early 40s pose nothing less than, quote, the pamphlet, the question of the relationship between proletarian revolution and scientific practice. The pamphlet continues, still quoting, the class struggle concerning science unveiled by Lysenkoism, they write, is still here today, now, an integral part of class struggle as a whole. 1977, France. More specifically, given that the Bolshevik Revolution, they, 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 they write, did not overcome the bourgeois academic establishment, same point I made before with regard to the two scientists, Lysenkoism should be understood as a rank and file endeavor to orient research towards the need of the people by replacing the university discourse with a truly dialectical materialist approach. If the Chinese, they call it themselves, if the Chinese, in the sense of cultural uh, revolution, if the Chinese consciousness of this revolutionary movement in the end led to a huge colossal fiasco, they, they, they acknowledge that openly, of course, and even transformed itself to its opposite, this only happened because the movement did not continue to adhere to the dialectical principle according to which science is a movement, a process, that is to say, the articulation of the contradictions among which scientists must recover the contradiction, man nature, and class contradictions. So I think to put it more generally, their point, which is very similar as we will see in a while, I'll return to this point, to the point that the, uh, Richard Levinson and Richard Leventy make, the point, the problem, the theoretical problem 
with Lysenkoism that then led to its complete identification with personality cult and establishment Stalinism is that he or they didn't understand that dialectical analysis in the life sciences and in sciences in general should be taken as a critique of scientific ideology, not the advancement of specific theses to be opposed to other theses, in this case, specific uh, anti-bourgeois uh, genetic thesis to be opposed to what was perceived to be bourgeois genetics, that is to say the Mendelian, Morganian interpretation of uh, genetics and then, of course, of Darwinian theory as a whole. <clears throat> In other words, Lysenkoism ended up founding the general opposition between proletarian and bourgeois sci science on specific contents, this is the point, on conflicting science, scientific thesis. This is the problem that uh, Badiou and his comrades identify with Lysenko. And Levin Salavantin says something quite uh, similar. I mean, the problem with a dialectical analysis of, uh, in this case, genetics turning into a new uber university discourse is the following. As soon as you start promoting specific conflicting scientific thesis, I give you an example. Of course, um, um, what in terms of the basic genetics of, of the 30s, remember like this is like the early uh, stages of uh, research on genetics, of course, um, Lysenkoism was almost obliged, even though there are some contra contra contradictory stances there, to recognize the, existen the existence of chromosomes. They could be seen, okay? What he didn't recognize was the uh, existence of, of, of genes, in a sense. And at that point, it was still um, not a contentious issue, but of course, even in Western um, Europe, and we can, um, Western world and Western Europe especially, we can discuss this later on, um, there were still attempts to actually merge certain trends of uh, late Lamarckism with uh, the Morganian, um, the Morganian Mende Mendelian uh, genetic approach to Darwinian theory. Okay? So m the point here I'm making is basically that according to Badiou and his comrades, the idea is that as soon as Lysenkoism tried to say, okay, we think the chromosomes exist, but pair genes on uh, paired alleles, well, that, that is not the case. And this is like non-bourgeois science, okay? That is when a dialectical analysis, a dialectical critique of the life sciences become nothing but a re-instantiation, a repetition, if not a strengthening of the ideology uh, it, it, it attempts to criticize. In doing so, <clears throat> in doing so, um, but you and, and, and the others write, Lysenkoism became very quickly a vulgar form of evolutionism that wrongly associated universal class struggle with the obtainment of isolated results. That's a point, in a sense. Conflicting scientific, scientific thesis, we do not believe in uh, the existence of genes or the location of genes in this specific part of the chromosomes. And if you do believe in that, you are actually upholding in bourgeois science. When you are taking that road, but you and the others seem to be uh, suggesting, that is to say, when you're looking for the obtainment of isolated results to be opposed to what is mainstream ideological um, um, uh, science, uh, you are on the wrong track. This is where your dialectical analysis becomes something completely different, if not opposite to what um, dialectical analysis should be. As I said before, it must be noted that Levins and Levantin, the two scientists, drew, uh, draw a very similar conclusion when they state, and I'm quoting from them, uh, I think this is pretty much the point I've been making for the last couple of minutes, the error of the Lysenkoist claim, they write, arises from attempting to apply a dialectical analysis of physical problems from the wrong end. Dialectical materialism in the sciences is not and has never been a programmatic method for solving particular physical problems, say about chromosomes. Rather, dialectical analysis provides an overview and a set of warning signs against particular form of dogmatism and narrowness of thought, end of quote. 
you see, in this sense, Levinson Levantine, from a scientific standpoint, and uh, but you and his comrades, from a more political standpoint, I think um, um, end up with a very similar point. That is to say, the dialectical analysis applied to life sciences is most is most of all, if not exclusively, a form of critique, a form of critique of scientific ideology. And if you go beyond that, if you go beyond the level of critique, then you are in deep trouble. And this is what happened with Lysenkoism. This is the kind of analysis um, they seem to propose. Now, let me move to my own interest in, in, um, in Lysenko on the basis of what I just said. In light of these considerations, my overall claim is that there is still today, clearly in post-Soviet times, a communist Lysenkoist political legacy in the domain of biological dialectical materialism that philosophy should appropriate after learning the hard lesson of what did not work with Lysenko in the USSR. To paraphrase the quote uh, from the two scientists about Engels I read out before, I would say provocatively, Trofim Denisovich Lysenko got it wrong most of the times, but sometimes, few times, got it right where it really matters. Generally speaking, this appropriation should first of all relate the Lysenkoist attempted cultural revolution in biology to a prestigious tradition of materialist speculation in the life sciences, itself driven by a powerful political vision that brings together the likes of, again, Jacques Monod and Stephen Jay Gould. What I'm saying is, of course, I referred to Monod earlier as one of the most outspoken critics of the Lysenkoist establishment in the 50s. Nevertheless, my point is that critically, one can return to Lysenko, in a sense, insert, it, insert the attempted cultural revolution we've been talking about in the sciences within a kind of long-term genealogy of materialist speculation in life sciences. And very, very generally speaking, what I'm saying is that one could start with the dialectics of nature and the anti during and make connections up to the late uh, Stephen Jay Gould and see what has been a number of trends that have been uh, consistently, of course, in different cultural contexts and in more or less objectively valid scientific fashion, I've been consistently trying to criticize the idealist and metaphysical assumptions on which evolutionary theory, if not more generally biology, relies and still relies. As Richard Levantine, same scientist but in another book uh, called The Doctrine of DNA, it's a 1993 book, as Levantine puts it in his polemical manifesto, The Doctrine of, of DNA, at present, biology continues to be possibly more than ever an ideology. It's just enough to open the papers and usually we discover things such as um, new, new scientific research in uh, the United States has identified the gene responsible for usually schizophrenia and homosexuality. That, that's the main... Religion, reason. Exactly, exactly. So as, as Levantine puts it in his polemical manifesto, biology at present continues to be possibly more than ever an ideology. Contra the likes of Richard Dawkins and the advocates of sociobiology and biological determinism, who more or less silently, in my opinion, perpetuate the most reactionary assumptions of 20th century eugenics, Levantine conclaims that, again, my epigraph, genes can make nothing. What does it mean? Well, it means that, quote, isolating the gene as the master molecule and the genome is another unconscious ideological commitment, end of quote. This doesn't mean that Levantine is saying uh, at Harvard, genes do not exist. No, of course. He's just saying isolating the gene as the master molecule is another unconscious ideological commitment. Okay? Thinking that specific traits, phenotypic traits, depend exclusively on a certain genotype is an ideological commitment. And we can return to this in the discussion because there's a lot going on in so-called evil devil theory, evolutionary de developmental theory right now in, in, in the first decade of the year 2000 that has problematized uh, not only, of course, the way in which uh, individual phenotypes can be, uh, of course, changed and manipulated uh, by the environment. 
But the very assumption that heredity is just a matter of genes is right now uh, in a lot of cutting edge um, biological philosophy and also experimental biology a topic which is being discussed. Mm -hmm. So we are not going back to the uh, transmission of acquired traits, you know, the usual giraffe example, uh, Lamarckian example. It's not that easy. Of course, Lamarck, these scientists are not saying Lamarck was right, but there are tendencies, and they tend to define themselves as neo Lamarckians. There are new debates in scientific circles that, in my opinion, go back to debates which were not specifically debates concerning Lysenkoism, but which allowed, in a sense, the Lysenkoists to criticize. So these are debates that precede Lysenko of the late 20s and 30s. These debates, in a sense, which try to find a medium position between Darwinian, Darwinian revolutionary theory and neo-Lamarckian um, neo elements, and consequently criticize what has become, what became in the 30s with the great synthesis, but is still now today, the reigning ideology of genetics, that is to say, the so-called uh, Mendel-Morgan um, Mendel paradigm, for which basically genes are everything. I mean, uh, the, 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 the phenotype is completely de dependent on genotype, and heredity is a matter of what? Of uh, gene ran mutations are the consequence of genes random variation happening uh, random mutation genes random mutation happening over um, thousand, over hundred thousand of years okay this is pretty much put into doubt by cutting edge contemporary um, contemporary um, evolutionary theory. Uh, not just evolutionary theory, but as I said before, evolutionary developmental theory, and we can return to this in the discussion. Lysenko, of course, and just want to make this clear, was wrong. Lysenko went obviously too far, for instance, when he refused to acknowledge the, existen the existence of pair genes lodged in pair chromosomes, not to mention his acolytes, his followers, claim that they were able to transform wheat into rice into rye in a single step, or that, quote, three generations of socialism will so change the genes as to make all races look equal, end of quote. Of course, Lysenko and the Lysenkoists were wrong, but more recent discoveries, we're talking about the last 30 years and even more the last decade, increasingly indicate that although we are certainly influenced and limited by our genes, differences in phenotype including differences in neural, neuronal connections, we're talking about epigenetics here, are in equal measure, measure the result of genes and developmental environment, and also a good amount of sheer contingency. I call it like that from a philosophical standpoint. The technical term would be uh, developmental noise, that is to say the random variation in growth and division of cells during development. Clearly, to date, what I've just talked about is not, by and large, the sort of information the general public finds in popular scientific magazines or television documentaries, which invariably focus on the identification of that gene for that behavior, that gene for that trait, or more technically, that gene for that phenotype. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, and I come from the, for, for the, to the more philosophical point I want to make, from a more theoretical perspective, I believe that philosophy should return, a materialist philosophy should return to and re-elaborate Lysenko's unabashed challenge to the unspoken metaphysical, i.e. idealist and vitalist presuppositions of genetics and evolutionary theory. Not all of it, but mainstream uh, Mendelian, Morganian um, approach to evolutionary theory. This is, of course, not a critique straightforward critique of Darwin. And remember, Lysenko never, and Lysenko is never qualified themselves as uh, Lamarckians, never. They call themselves creative Darwinists. So, of course, um, what I'm trying to say here is that from a more theoretical perspective, I'm interested in Lysenko's and the Lysenkoists' uh, critique of what they call the idealists themselves, assumptions of genetics and evolutionary theory. Why? Well, because they're still with us today. In my, in my vision, in a sense, like to speak of a selfish gene, Dawkins, 
or also certain debates in the philosophy of mind, um, I'm making the name here of Daniel Dennett, in a sense they all share the same metaphysical view about genes and the mind. Okay? And of course I'm not the first to make this point, the big debate between uh, Stephen Jay Gould and uh, Richard Dawkins was precisely about that. You cannot reify something like the mind, the mind is not a thing. Okay? And you cannot speak of causation in philosophical terms uh, when you are talking about the relationship between genes and specific phenotypic traits. So this is something which has been de debated in the philosophy of biology for the last 25, 30 years. From a more philosophical perspective, thinkers such as Davide Tarizzo is a biopolitical thinker, not well known outside of Italy. I think he will become well known now. Some of his books are being translated by Stanford University Press, I think. I, the Agamben and Negri's generation is being replaced by a newer and more interesting generation. So thinkers such as Davide Tarizzo have recently shown how classical Darwinism, so this is also Darwin himself, is itself a metaphysics insofar as it relies on what? Well, on the notion of autonomous life. I quote Tarizzo, Darwinian biology consists of what is undoubtedly a set of scientific theories which are nonetheless brought together under a metaphysical indicator, which is what? The abstract idea that is life as such, end of quote. In other words, Darwinian biology and vitalism share the same conditions of possibility. This is Tarizzo's point in a nutshell. The life sciences are ultimately based on the a priori thesis according to which each and every form of life each and every living being is nothing else than a transitory instantiation of what is in the end, the continuous energy called life. According to Tarizzo, such a metaphysical framework entails a series of insidious implications which are, at a closer inspection, inherently political, or even better, biopolitical. If life is a will to live that as such intends to live more and more, then the strengthening of the force of life will express precisely the freedom of the vital self. As Daniel Dennett problematically has it, and I'm paraphrasing Dennett, freedom appeared in the word, it's incredible he said something like that, freedom appeared in the word in concomitance with the emergence of life, this is his argument, and the criterion thanks to which we can assess whether a living being is improving, he says that, getting better, is the gradual increase of his natural liberty, which is in turn, according to Dennett, an increase in its chances of survival. This is like mainstream, very respected philosophy of mind, Daniel Dennett. In brief, I'm paraphrasing what Dennett says, the word of autonomous life is the word of a permanent war. It is only a short step from here to what Tarizzo himself calls the racism of autonomous life, the racism of the freedom to live, the racism of men to come. As Tarizzo concludes, we should therefore not be satisfied, and it was the debate promoted, I think, by Stephen Jay Gould in the 70s and 80s, we should not be satisfied with any simplistic distinction between a good and neutral scientific Darwinism and a bad and proto-fascist social Darwinism. This is too simple, since they both underlie the same reactionary idealist metaphysics. Bearing in mind the important fact that Lysenko, was, that Lysenko always criticized Mendelian genetics in the name of a new created Darwinism, which would be able to conceive of dialectical jumps in evolution, and you know, the jumps in evolution, which of course Lysenko formulated in a very crass, simple way, it's the usual dialectical materialist argument of the transformation of quantity into quality. That was put in very bland and stupid terms, but think about very well notion uh, Stephen Jay Gould again of punctuated equilibrium. That is to say, uh, not actually following any longer Darwin when he speaks about uh, um, appearances, for instance, of new species uh, in terms of a continuum, but thinking of evolution also uh, from the perspective of what Gould called a saltational paradigm, saltational jump. You know, it's literally the same thing. I'm not saying that these debates, as discussed by Gould, are not doing nothing but repeating Lysenko. That would be stupid of me. But I'm saying that you can see from a philosophical perspective that these debates, contemporary debates, debates of the last 20 years, do have a certain geneal genealogical connection with uh, debates that surrounded the Lysenko affair. So my point is basically, 
as there are scientists today that can define themselves, both Darwinians and neo-Lamarckians, which, which doesn't mean that they are actually applying Lamarck to the latter, the same could be said with, with regard to, to Lysenko. This is my, my point. So bearing in mind the important fact that Lysenko was always criticized, always criticized Mendelian genetics in the name of a new creative Darwinism, which would be able to conceive of dialectical jumps in evolution, the transformation of quantity into quality. Should we not give a new meaning to catch phrases such as, and these are catch phrases for Lysenko himself and present, present was the, as you know, pro probably the, the, the philosopher standing back uh, and supporting Lysenko. Should we not give new meaning to catch phrases of the Lysenkoists, such as the shattering, they call it, or shaking of heredity, or more to the point, if you actually have read Catherine Malabou and her work on plasticity, what the Lysenkoists themselves call the plasticity of genes with regard to the environment. Now, I could go on for some other 10, 15 minutes, or should we stop? Because this... You can go on. Okay. Of course, this central part of the paper is the one I personally care the most. Um, but now I would like to move on and actually uh, conclude with some, um, um, some consideration about, again, the possibility of um, interspecies change and, of course, the narratives, the logical narratives surrounding animals, uh, plants, but also uh, classes, uh, uh, social classes uh, in human beings in the post-Soviet uh, period. And again, here I'm deeply indebted to Oksana Timofeva because this is mostly her part of the, of the job. Lysenkoism uh, was, of course, is, of course, now defamed as a black spot on red biology. Of course, uh, it's recognized that Soviet biology was, was achieved a lot. Uh, of course, the name of the likes of Oparin have never been uh, discarded by Western biology, but Lysenkoism is a kind of black spot on red biology. And it's supposed to provide some of the most striking arguments against the applicability or even the link between politics and natural science. So natural science and politics should be separated always, otherwise the risk is to fall back into, um, into something similar to Lysenkoism. Since the perestroika years, if not earlier, the figure of Lysenko has been used as a scapegoat embodying all the sins of Soviet totalitarianism as seen from the perspective of science. We find reference of this in mass culture and even rock music, for instance, uh, in uh, Andrew Makarevich's songs, uh, Weeds Generate Weeds, produced in 1991, the year of the end of the Soviet Union. Of course, I didn't know this. Uh, Oksana just um, passed it on to me, but I think it's really, really good to, to see the change of um, the Lysenko signifier, we could say, in, in the post-Soviet years. Quote from the song, Disagrees were becoming shooting marks. Everyone could be put against the wall. Academic comrade Trofim Lysenko taught us to change the word. A king being drunk with his lies, he was waiting for miracles from earth and skies. But weeds, weeds, generated weeds. White bread didn't grow out from weeds. Wolves generate wolves. A tender fellow deer won't grow up from a wolf cub. Worms generate worms. A proud falcon won't grow up from the worm. Weeds generated weeds. Wolves generated wolves. Worms generated worms. It is difficult not to contrast this depressed and depressing post-Soviet weed with Platonov's friendly weed, pas passionate with communist desire. Remember the quote. After the collapse of socialism in the Soviet Union, inferior plants and animals, this is the message, have simply no more chance to improve their condition. Some species are more noble than others, and there is no way to escape this matter of fact. Here we have a natural metaphor, clearly, of society. We're talking about rock, so it's a natural metaphor of society, whereby everything perpetuates itself as identical to itself. All that we can obtain is just a continuous repetition of the same. The word does not contemplate any possibility of change. By merely reproducing itself, everything equals one. In other words, there can be no class struggle in natural science, remember Platono, insofar as there can be no class struggle in nature, 
and there can be no class struggle in society because society should correspond to nature, especially if we find right, found out the right genes and what they are responsible for. There is a certain natural order of things which must be followed. We can pretend to change it only by means of violence, blood, and terror. And even if we do so, things will nevertheless finally come back to their present state. In 1988, the Soviet director Vladimir Borko shot a film based on Mikhail Bulgakov's novel Heart of a Dog. The action takes place in Moscow not long after the October Revolution. A well-off professor experiments a new kind of surgery by transforming a stray dog, Sharik, into a man. But after his transition to human is complete, it turns, the dog turns the life of the professor into a nightmare, and the latter, the professor, is forced to reverse the procedure. Sharikov becomes a dog again. As Alexei Pentzin points out, and I quote Alexei, in the era of perestroika, this novel became a real machine of the state, or a kind of ideological apparatus. Like a magnifying glass, this apparatus concentrates in a burning ray of hatred, blindness, and often simple stupidity, turning it to the very base of the great post-revolutionary culture of the 1920s." End of quote. Russian intelligence identified Sharikov in the, in the post-Soviet um, early 90s with a certain anthropological type produced by revolution. That is to say, the proletarian qua, we could say, the bastard. The moral, the morale was simple. Dogs generate dogs, worms generate worms, proletarians generate proletarians, and bastards generate bastards. One cannot generate a man out of a dog. One cannot generate a man out of a proletarian. And most, what one gets is a bastard. The slogan of the 1960s, socialism, remember, with a human face, paved the way, quite literally, to the conclusion that socialism cannot have a human face, but an animal face. Admittedly, Bulgakov's novel is also a satire targeted at Ivan Pavlov. By the way, Pavlov in the 50s was a staunch supporter of, of Lysenko. Yeah, yeah. Bulga Bulgakov's novel is also a satire targeted at Ivan Pavlov, the Soviet physiologist who experimented on dogs. The phrase Pavlov's dog has itself become a swear word, not just in Russia, but in the West as well and a metaphor for cruel experimentation on nature intended to materialize the utopia of a new man. At the more sophisticated level of artistic reflection, a similar critique can be found in the work of, in the work of Oleg Kulik, who during the 1990s was working a lot with animals and even seriously tried to transform himself into a dog. One of his most radical performances was indeed called Pavlov's Dog. What Kulik did, this is Oksana's point, as an artist, could be characterized as a kind of counter-utopia directly opposed to the utopia of the early Soviet revolutionary avant-garde, whereby animals were being transformed, emancipated into humans. As Renata Salitz has it, talking about Kulik, his counter-utopia follows the principles of deep ecology. So there's also like a kind of like siding with deep ecology, the ra radical ecological stance of the West, of some Western theoreticians and is theoretically ba based on an alleged, only alleged, denunciation of anthropocentrism. Ludmila uh, Bredikina, Kulik's uh, ex-wife and a collaborator of his, explains, for instance, that true democracy can only be based on the law of the jungle. So let's go back to pre hobbes for which the human being is just one animal species among others. Humans should rehabilitate the animal in them. This is the point their natural origin, that is to say, following Drew Silla, transform back from reflective to reflex being. Returning to Platonov quickly to conclude, we cannot neglect the figure of a man that becomes an animal which appears in his novel Rubbish Wind, written later in 1934. Here the Russian writer, we believe, anticipates the possible, but far from necessary, relapse of utopia into counter-utopia. So the argument here is that Platonov has both, in a sense, anticipates both uh, opposite ends of the spect spectrum, not only the utopian emancipation, uh, uh, liberation of animal into man, but also the opposite counter-utopia reactionary movement of the impossibility of that change and hence, in a sense, of the animalization of, of, of man himself.
The main character, uh, Robbie Schwind, Albert Lichtenberg, a physicist who studies cosmic space, transforms himself step by step into an indefinite animal, as he is unable to live as a human in Nazi Germany. He finds his last refuge in an animal body, which no one can recognize. And if in the sea of youth, the zoo technician, Wysokowski, was dreaming that the evolution of animal kingdom stopped in former times, I'm quoting, will recommence and all poor creatures being covered with hair who are now living in distemper will finally achieve the fate of a conscious life, this is the utopian pole, in rubbish Schwinn, the counter-utopian pole, we witness the reverse process, a man becoming covered with hair and losing his sanity, then being put into a concentration camp for not being sufficiently human. Class struggle, even for Platonov, seems to be lost in nature. But should we, open question, stick to this point of failure? Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. But this is a mostly as an instrument to criticize uh, those liberal uh, subject uh, discourse of being. Mm. It uh, has uh, uh, very specific uh, functional orientation, so object exists mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But maybe you, but also you mentioned uh, Latarian school, the university and master. Mm -hmm. Could we, my question, yeah. Yeah, my point about the university discourse uh, with regard to Lysenkoism, and you perfectly summarized my point about Lysenkoism, is to say I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually adopting him in a critical manner. Um, in terms of the university discourse, what, what I try to emphasize is precisely the fact that it's very difficult to distinguish and detach the moment at which the critique of the university discourse brought about, according to some readings, both scientific and political by Lysenko, turned into not only another version of the university discourse, but in a sense, almost the epitome of the university discourse. And here you have like a nice connection with Lacan. I mean, for Lacan, if you remember like Seminar 17, when he speaks about the university discourse, which is the embodiment of the master discourse in our contemporary society, he doesn't distinguish between the two blocks. He says the university discourse rules both in the capitalist world and in Soviet Russia. And it speaks precisely about the bureaucratic apparatus of science in Russia to give an, a concrete example of what he believes university discourse um, um, is. And of course, we are talking about the same years. So we're talking about the late 60s, so um, Lysenkoism was in decline, but at the same time was still an integral part of a certain uh, ideological establishment. So you talked about, you said like an opposition between two discourses. I think the point from a psychoanalytical Lacanian theory of discourses, the point is actually to, to actually try and think what is the transition between one discourse and the other. And the way, in which, because psychoanalysis itself proposes to be a transitional discourse, it's not like a, that discourse which is there to stay. There are specific historical coordinates that allow its emergence and development. So I would say in a sense, from a psychoanalytical perspective, if we try to think of Lysenkoism as a failed cultural revolution, the point is not so much when did it fail, but what was the cultural revolution component of Lysenkoism? Because I think this gives you the idea of what a transition between different discourses can be. I don't know if I got you right in, in, in the question. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, but of course, a very quick definition of the university discourse, according to Lacan, is a discourse which has knowledge in the position of the agent, in the position of the master. The university discourse is a discourse which uh, ultimately uh, prioritizes, if not, if, 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 if not only, uh, well, not only prioritizes, but completely focuses on the accumulation of knowledge. This is the point. Yeah. I have a <clears throat> comment. <clears throat> First of all, thank you. And thank you. Uh, I agree with most of what you said. Uh, um, but, uh, well, first of all, I, I think that the historical and uh, political meaning of Vesienkovism should maybe be um, spelled out in more detail because mm -hmm. it, it was a little lost. Because obviously, the, the, there was a political message mm -hmm. which was not only Lysenko's but also, um, for example, was characteristic for pedology. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're aware of mm -hmm. this movement of the, mm -hmm. of the 30s, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, wanted to transform ped pedagogy mm -hmm. from a similar point of, mm -hmm. point of view, from the point of view that uh, there is no such thing as uh, a nature of a child. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they all can be developed, etc. So mm. it was an activist approach yep. to nature, which you mentioned. Yep. Uh, and uh, it was linked to the idea that everything uh, can be transformed mm -hmm. uh, by the society and should be transformed. So, in this sense, it was a part of a, of, of a general ideology. But mm -hmm. interestingly, Stalin uh, had a very mm, diverse. Uh, mm, asynchronous policy with regard to uh, 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 different movements of mm. this kind. For example, pedology was destroyed in mm. the early, already in the mid-30s, while the center was twice uh, mm. affirmed. In linguistics, there mm. was a, a strange uh, avant-garde movement of Mar, which mm. was closer to genetics because it had these mm. atoms of, of language. Mm. But it was as crazy as Lysenko's from the point of view of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And then also Stalin crushed it, and uh, then he had his own linguistic theory yeah, yeah. In, the, in the late forties, um, uh, which was actually closer to Lysenko's methodology, which it was more active. Yep. So it was a general struggle of ideas even within yep. Stalinism. But uh, ob obviously the idea was political. The, the, well, the, the, the more interesting more interesting part was the idea that you can develop nature. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> this is an obvious idea. And it, you cannot argue against it in mm -hmm. principle, right? You can argue on uh, <clears throat> on the fact that there are, there is also stubborn, stumble, re stumbling reality. Mm -hmm. Some, some kernel of, of the real that you cannot change. Sure. So that's kind of the, the voice of the ratio, mm. which, which you can address to Lysenko and to Vygotsky, yeah. who yeah. was one of the pedologists. Yeah. Uh, so so oh, okay, so you had Vygotsky in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Vygotsky was not alone, it was a social movement. Vygotsky, whom, by the way, is being read quite widely now no, in debates in biopolitics in Italy. Unlike Lysenko, Vygotsky yeah, yeah. is a figure of establishment. Yeah, yeah. He, he was recognized, but he is a political figure yeah, of the yeah, time, yeah, yeah. and also very critical with regard to the mainstream yeah, science. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, and, and making similar points mm. to, to Lysenko. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, the, the, my, the, 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 my point that I'm trying to make is that uh, can't you see a priori that these are two perspectives on the real? Mm. In physics, notably, they have been reconciled somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in physics there was a similar clash of basically two philosophical, political uh, trends that, basically, that obviously pointed in, in uh, a resurrection. But physicists, being be maybe better philosophers than uh, mm -hmm. uh, biologists, they saw that these are a priori uh, yeah, yeah. positions. And so then there was the compromise in Heisenberg and yep, yeah, no. before, etc. Uh, but there has been no, well, and 
maybe there was a similar compromise in the theory of evolution with mm. the introduction of the ideas of aromorphosis. Mm. So, because now the current Darwinism does, is not Darwinism. They don't mm. believe that everything is incremental adaptation. Yeah. Right? So there was a similar thing. But still we have the ideas that genes determine uh, mm. endocrine and, and, and uh, similar bullshit, which doesn't work since the logic. Uh, so uh, uh, my point is that maybe you, you, you rely a little too much on the reference to science as the figure of the you know, master or university. Mm. Because you were saying, oh yeah, but science also proves it. But what if it, sure. do, what if it didn't? Sure. I mean, if, even if they yeah. prove in thousands of uh, statistical studies yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, people with a gene X uh, uh, have a religion, mm. it will not make me believe mm. this as, as true. Mm. No, it's interesting that you say that because it maybe depends, it depends on the audience, but it, um, no, I was not trying to actually prove Lysenko's possibility or partial possibility by endorsing myself for the scientific discourse. And this is why I opposed, actually I juxtaposed because they're saying more or less the same thing, uh, Levinson and Leventy on the one hand and but you uh, and, and, and the political. But yes, um, my point is not to try and show how contemporary science, even if I understand I can give that impression, shows that after all, Lysenko was not that wrong. I mean, more generally, I think science in this kind of, of, of research should have, yes, a prevalent position, but it's just like one voice amongst others. Because of course, as you said, the historical and the social context is incredibly important. Which leads me to your first point. Clearly, I have to, especially in this second version, of, of the paper, and which um, is still a work in progress and will have to be expanded, uh, I had to limit my cultural and historical uh, considerations. And I'm very much, I'm very much uh, aware of the fact, as I hinted at in the presentation, that of course Lysenko didn't come out of the blue. I mean, what uh, early uh, Soviet science, given the specific cultural and political uh, climate, even in the early Stalin, uh, Stalin years, um, late 20s, uh, what well, that specific uh, context allowed is a negotiation between two a priori paradigms, which are still with us today. That is to say, bluntly put, straight uh, genetic Darwinism, which is not Darwin for a simple reason, because Darwin uh, um, uh, com comes before Mendel and Morgan. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, certain uh, lingering trends of neo-Lamarckism, which were even in the 20s and 30s much more complex than the usual Volgata, uh, the detractory Volgata against Lamarckism uh, makes us believe. Okay? So clearly, Lysenko inserted himself in a certain context and in a sense, up until, and this is more a cultural and historical consideration, up until 1948, even if you read like the reports from the uh, genetics congresses, etc., etc., up, up until 1948, uh, Lysenko didn't win. I mean, even Stalin himself, even though he was uh, uh, supporting uh, implicitly, implicitly uh, Lysenko and clearly exterminating, exiling uh, a lot of his opponents, including especially Vavilov, his, his uh, former mentor. Up until 1945, Lysenko did not become, Lysenkoism did not become a, um, um, a regime ideology. So this gives us, again, um, an idea of the level of debate that was ongoing in the 30s, even during the purges, in a sense. Just to make some names, for instance, on the Lysenko side, of course, you do have all the work um, crazy work of, of Williams in agrobiology uh, with the guy that basically said that fertilizers uh, are not needed. So, uh, you know, like in all collective farms, you have like specific, sp uh, specific uh, um, maps of, 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 how can I put it, like the nature of soil and specific calculation to uh, establish what is uh, best to be grown where. And, and there has been like uh, interesting papers showing how, how, how in, a, in the end, like fertilizers were introduced, introduced on a mass scale in the Soviet Union only because of the war, because of course the fertilizing industry is very close to uh, producing weapons in a sense, you know, so after World War II. On the other side of the spectrum, you, you had not only 
uh, we're talking about the life sciences, not, not, not even uh, pedagogy, etc. Uh, you have, uh, of course, Vavilov, uh, but also figures such as uh, Koltsov, uh, like um, early experiments on, for instance, like uh, sex mutations in, in, in insects. But also like very, very complex figures, and he is one of my favorite, uh, um, the American Müller. Müller, he was a, a self-declared uh, socialist. He came to uh, the Soviet Union, I think, in 28 and 30s. But he was himself a, a Morganian Mendelian. He, he won a, a Nobel Prize in medicine in 48 for his work on Drosophila. So a straightforward uh, Morganian uh, Mendelian um, scholar. All these people clearly were fighting a battle for what we could call uh, scientific hegemony. So I think my point is, to go back to the early Soviet era, is that the space open by the early, the space for discussion and problematization of what were some scientific hegemonic uh, ideas uh, outside the Soviet Union was so wide that Stalinism itself, it took for Stalinism itself more than a decade and the war to impose one vision. So I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure whether, you know, like, um, in the, in, the, in, in the late 30s, I mean, there's been some speculation about that, that in the end, you know, like uh, Lysenkoism was preferred over uh, other attempts at mediating dialectical materialism and genetics, because there are a lot of those attempts as well, uh, because of uh, Stalin's predilection for gardening. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this is an easy way out, but in a sense, uh, what I'm trying to make, uh, my point more generally, is that given the complexity of the cultural and social context, very little would have sufficed to, as you pointed out with regard to other fields, to adopt the opposite paradigm as the official paradigm. This is my point. And one, one last issue, because you said like, uh, the point on physics is very interesting because, um, of course, there is a new, what is called the great synthesis of the 30s, carried out especially by British biologists. That is to say, to put it very bluntly, for those of you who do not know it, uh, how science, uh, life sciences put together uh, Darwin with Mendel. Because, of course, Mendel came after Darwin. And this became the doxa, which is still the doxa that dictates, in a sense, uh, news, newspaper articles about we found a gene, etc., etc. Et um, what is increasingly clear if you read, um, if you read um, philosophy of biology, theoretical biology, but also um, to the extent that one can understand it, because at times it becomes very complicated, uh, experimental work carried out by uh, so-called devel developmental evolutionary biologists. It's clear that biologists today, some of them, but they are quite mainstream if they publish with MIT Press, are looking for what they call a new synthesis. So I think, and this is the debate you raised, the fact that, um, of course, physics found that synthesis, which reconciles uh, reconcile what philosophically seems to be irreconcilable, mm? two completely apriorisically different views on the real. Uh, this is a very, very um, heated debate going on in the life sciences today, especially with the emergence of so-called evo devo ev ev evolution developmental um, evolution developmental biology, and clearly all the discoveries in epigenetics. I mean, we briefly touched on that in the presentation when we talked about, you know, if neuronal connections are, and then of course stupidly one can be statistically 80% dependent on the, on, on the development of the organism and hence on, on, on the environment. Hmm? How, how do we draw a distinction between phenotype and genotype? This is what is being problematized today um, as a philosopher, what I can understand in very important debates in biology. This division between genotype and phenotype doesn't hold, doesn't hold any longer. And everything is ruined. Exactly, exactly, exactly. No, it, there, there is one, one specific author, which I think is incredibly interesting for philosopher, um, West Eberhardt, Mary Jane West Eberhardt, and she has this book on, this it's West, we like West, I think it's uh, Mary, I think Mary or Mary Jane West Eberhard, 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 yeah, something, something like that. 
Um, the book, it's a 2005 book, which has become sort of Bible in these circles. Um, it's something like developmental biology and plasticity, something like that. Remember, like uh, one of the first debates uh, that Lysenko uh, put to the front, put to the fore in the early 30s, uh, was about what goes by the name of vernalization. Ver 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 what? Vernalization. Ver I mean, no, no, no. Vernalization is to say the planting, basically the planting of wheat varieties that are um, winter varieties in, ah, in okay. spring. Vernalizatia, how do you say? I think it's vernalizatia, something like that in uh, Russian, it's taken from Russia. But that debate, which became, you know, like a, he famously planted uh, one specific crop uh, at his father's farm and then claimed, of course, that uh, the, 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 the result was excellent, et cetera, et cetera. And that there was all spin, spinning, as we would say today, in terms of, of the result, which were very poor indeed. But the theoretical debate there, which I find interesting, even though, of course, he's not a talented scientist, you know, he's a cross scientist, but he made this, this distinction between development, devel development and growth. Hmm? I mean, talking about plants, I mean, growth is not development. Hmm? So, in a sense, if we buy, for instance, um, um, using exposition to heat uh, or other environmental factors, uh, manipulate the plant, we can obtain some results, for instance, like make crops that are usually planted in, in winter, uh, um, plant them in, 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 in the spring, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I always find that there is a quite, well, underneath you find like quite relevant philosophical points, even uh, regarding debates that seem to be almost anecdotal by now, that is to say how to plant wheat, uh, wheat crops uh, which are uh, of the winter type in spring, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, I mean, plasticity. I think even, uh, even I think in Russian is something similar. I mean, plasticity by now, not only uh, in evolu evolutionary developmental theory, but uh, in continental philosophy, plasticity I is the new term. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, with Katarina Malabu trying to find a connection between the cognitive sciences and a sort of post deridian philosophy, plasticity is, is with us, in a sense. And I think there was a question. Yeah. Was, uh, Ali, uh, I really like uh, the presentation, actually. I would like to see the text much, but I think it's a sure. little somewhere. Uh, the problem why the audience could have been larger is that simultaneously there's a professor at MIT giving a class on this okay. years which has affected the nature of audience who have been here. So 25 students right now are sitting in front of them. Okay. And uh, what they're discussing is different versions of, you know, STS, in particular emphasis on active network theory. On what? Enter network. Laptop. Okay, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So sure. I'm listening to you and different versions of uh, attention which uh, uh, the writers and the theorists of the Russian Revolution gave to the agency of grass, uh, like from Terra, yeah, yeah. or animal like people, or, or things, or your analysis of Platonov. I mean, I was kind of was sitting and reminding myself of the uh, analysis of Platon, uh, which is a usual for Russian literary analysis, uh, which basically says that he applies a very specific technique of anti formalism, mm -hmm. of non estrangement. Uh, I don't know what it was translated into English from this book, but yeah, I don't know that. Uh, uh, what is the aesthetics of non estrangement? Yeah, what could be a soul? Yeah, but this is Russian, I'm not sure what it's called in English. And she wrote it in America, though, I'm sure it's that. Oh, so, Anti-formalism. Mm. So basically there, uh, what she claims is that uh, we can never figure out 
basically a, conne a connection with Latour. Blatt Liput, you are saying, like a connection with Latour. Uh, difficult question, I would say. Clearly, I think what I'm trying to do shares with a certain Latourian critique is uh, what I could call a certain debunking or de demystification of the empiri of the truth of laboratory uh, experiments based on alleged uh, empirical uh, objectivity. Because um, I, I've developed on this, for instance, one of, um, one of the three or four points which uh, are present throughout the Lysenkoist literature, and maybe the most convincing, uh, in addition to the critique of idealism, the proposition of creative Darwinism, uh, and more dialectical materialist considerations about the, changing, the change of uh, quantity into quality in evolution, is the critique, the critique of statistics. The critique of statistics, I think, is in terms of like our contemporary interests, uh, anti-theological interests in the life sciences, is possibly the most interesting uh, element to be recuperated from th that debate. Clearly, a critique of statistics is, if brought to an extreme, uh, clearly also a critique of the uh, alleged truth that are based on the uh, alleged uh, scientific objectivity of labs. So, I know it's a loose connection, but, it, you know, I mean, going back to Latour, uh, Latour's original breakthroughs, I think th this, this can be a connection. And again, I think like, uh, somebody like Stephen Jay Gould is very important here because um, arguably one of the most popular books by, by Gould, and in my opinion, maybe the best, The Mismeasure of Man, is nothing but a uh, radical critique. It's an old book by now, 86, I think, now there's a new edition. Oh, the, 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 he wrote a longer edition before dying. But it's basically a staunch critique of, 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 of statistics showing uh, not only how statistics is one with um, uh, social determinism, uh, or it can be one with social determinism, but also that statistics, in a sense, is uh, the product of the legacy of a certain uh, eugenic, eugenic uh, um, approach to the, the, the life sciences, in a sense. Um, what else? Well, something else I wanted to say about statistics. Um, just. Um, just slip my mind. I mean, an, an anecdote, I think, th th there is a discussion uh, between, uh, which has been recently, a lot of the debates, official debates of the 30s and even the 48 infam infamous uh, ban on genetics are now even available in, in English. Some historians of science, there's a guy called Rolls Hansen, a Swedish uh, historian of science, have, have collected all the uh, exchanges, in a sense. At times they are completely grotesque, but at times they, are, they quite capture the point in a very um, stupid, banal manner. So you have, for instance, present, um, I think, uh, uh, attacking that point Keller. Keller was also uh, an, another uh, geneticist, quite, quite famous, that uh, ended up badly in those years. Uh, his point is basically, statistics is not a science, and he makes the following example. He says, well, you work on Drosophila, okay. Uh, you're trying to determine um, how many uh, genetic mutations you obtain after such and such exposure to X-rays, which was cutting edge science in those years. But then you have in the end to decide whether, you know, like uh, uh, that specific trait is X or Y. Say, bombardment with X-rays and then the wings of the Drosophila, instead of being black, they are gray. Hmm? And then you have like 10 specimens and you have to make some uh, calculation. And he said, well, this to me is the same thing as I actually taking uh, 10 loaves of bread, putting them in the oven, uh, baking them, and then taking them out and ask somebody, could you please tell me whether they are big or, big or small? Mm -hmm. Now, this is clearly not scientific reasoning, but I think in terms of the critique of ideology, it can be developed in a much, much more uh, constructive way. And it's not so far from the debunking of statistics that somebody like... Uh, um, like Gould does as a developer. And of course, uh, let's be clear, Gould has a very, very clear argument. He says, uh, okay, statistics is by now uh, supporting the entirety of not only life sciences, but of many uh, social sciences, say sociology. You know, like uh, first year students in sociology and psychology, like in biology, you have to go through uh, factor analysis, for instance, which is 
specifically what uh, Gould targets. Factor analysis as a mathematical method, fine with me. But the point is like the way in which factor analysis, which as a mathematical method works, is actually used ideologically. And this is what we read in uh, scientific uh, popular literature every day. You know, like one thing is saying, you have this number of vectors and this number of factors, and then you have certain ratios of uh, values between different results. Another thing is saying, well, from this, uh, tests uh, we can assess somebody's intelligence of course I mean referring to the old IQ uh, debate but I think this is still really really topical but I know I just um, kept on talking about related things but to go back to your point um, difficult question because I'm not a specialist on, I mean I don't know that much about Latour but I think like the link I would make between what I'm trying to do um, especially with contemporary scientists that I think c could dialogue or recuperate the Lysenko, Lysenkoist debate legacy, and Latour would be a debunking of the alleged objectivity, the alleged objective truth that one supposedly can, uh, uh, based on uh, alleged empirical uh, evidence. The most brilliant interpretation uh, along these lines would be that uh, the Cultural Revolution happened not when this wanted to force matter to submit to proletarian will and new mm. products which are impossible by nature, mm. even though he wanted to see this Cultural Revolution and also change maybe the practice of uh, experimentation mm. based on dialectic and uh, yeah. interpretation of natural philosophy. So that would be, I think, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The cultural revolution in Latour's interpretation would be that it was staged by Horn itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horn, yeah. which wanted to become a fine trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, that when agency is described, you know, to things rather than humans, mm. and can uh, an animate object be subject to a cultural revolution? Mm. I mean, this poses a completely different set No, I think the point you raise concerning methodology is quite interesting in relation to why the supposed cultural revolution that Lysenkoist uh, uh, strive for failed. Because as I said before, and I think here both the scientists and the, polit the, the, the political activists, uh, Badiou and partners, agree. The point is like they very quickly ended up by opposing to official science different specific results. And that's, that's the end of it, because in a sense, like, they need never, they never challenge, they never yeah, challenge. They compete on their own territory. In a sense, not even their own territory. They were disqualifying the methodology, as I said about statistics, but they didn't have a methodology. So when you have, like, uh, mainstream scientists, uh, um, even, even in the 30s, saying, well, but you don't have a methodology, clearly they do have a point there. There, there was no, that, that's, that's the point, I mean, in a sense, and it goes back maybe to the question about discourses, because in a sense, if we go back not, not only to Lacan, but even like a more scientific uh, uh, idea of what I would call a scientific discourse and a theory of scientific discourse, say uh, Kuhn, okay? I mean, clearly, to oppose, to um, op uh, change the sign of, sci of a scientific, of a scientific uh, statement, is not enough, far from enough, to even uh, um, allow the possibility of introducing a new paradigm. This is the I think the question of methodology is really, really important. And I think this is also what people who are trying to merge the two traditions, not Lysenko and, 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 and the non Lysenkoist, but I would say more generally, the, the, signifier and da the signifier Darwin and the signifier Lamarck are, are, are doing now. What they are doing now, I think they are really, really struggling with the uh, problematization of the methodology. Mm. To give you like a, 
um, 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 an anecdote. I, I, I read like a piece by um, by a philosopher of biology who was very, very um, inclined to support uh, um, uh, this new development in evolutionary developmental theory and the problematization of the strict uh, dichotomy between phenotype and genotype. So the recuperation of some Lamarckian uh, Lamarckian uh, themes, but then it recurs to questionnaires mm, to show how their ideology, the so-called, let's say, could have put it, uh, Morganian Mendelian ideology, is so ingrained within us. Do you understand my point? So, an attempt to criticize what we were criticizing before, say, that gene causes homosexuality, that gene causes, huh? an attempt to criticize that is carried out by means of questionnaires. The, the, there is a gene of Mendele, Mendele's Morganism. Yeah. Because in an attempt to show how this, this idea is so deeply ingrained in, 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 in